Hello, this is David Mandel, and I'm um, I'm doing a recording here on the Wide World Web, and uh, on an old overview. We're not going to talk about the partic your particular assignments. We're not going to talk about uh, writing CSS, uh, cascading style sheets. We're not going to talk about um, uh, tables and lists per se. But I want to talk about where your work fits into the overall frame. As you see, I'm giving this talk from a, a kind of a warehouse or a uh, what you what used to be an old marijuana grow house. It's now a um, uh, music studio, or my son and I are remaking it into a music studio. He bought it recently, and um, um, and um, so the background's not that beautiful. The lighting is bad. You see dots coming across my um, uh, 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 <laughs> dots coming out for because the lighting's bad. Anyway, <coughs> ignore that. I think we can do the video anyway. I've got good connection here. I spent a few days. Well, I spent a little bit of time getting us a hard wire. So I think we. I think everything's going to be cool. Whoops. Okay, so we're going to talk about the wor the wide world web, the big picture, by David Mandel. I think I've got an outline of what I want to talk about over here. Um, the first thing to notice is that the wide world w web is not the internet. Um, some people get confused about that, um, especially I know a lot of older people who seem to think that, you know, <coughs> if you've got chromium, you've got it all. Well, that's not quite true. The internet was started long before the wide world web. And uh, the first, ta it was, the internet started in about 1969. All it is is a worldwide network of computers wired together in using all sorts of different wires and different physical topologies using a common protocol that so they can all talk to one another and some sort of fancy elaborate routing system sometimes static often dynamic so that if a portion of the system goes down a portion of the network, it gets the traffic gets rerouted uh, automatically in such a way that um, all the computers can talk to one another. Uh, the first application, one of the first applications people wanted for the internet for was, of course, email. Mail was very important, and then file transfer. In the early days, well, actually, in the early days before the internet. People started to do email, and if you ever study email, you're going to notice that the email protocols, the email verbiage that we use really doesn't fit the internet. That's because it was before the internet and they made different decisions. Sometimes they order things different uh, than the internet orders things, and you've got to translate between email uh, uh, vocabulary and uh, internet vocabulary. Another thing people wanted to do in the early days was to transfer files. They came up with a system called UUCP. That is actually predates the internet. I used it before we had the internet. But things like email and UUCP, as soon as we got the internet, People move those to the internet so they can be used on the internet as well. Um, there was another file transfer protocol which we use to this day called FTP. Uh, it's kind of kludgy, but it works very well. And um, most people don't even realize how kludgy it is. Um, sometimes you want to log on to different systems like mainframe computers. Uh, for that, we for a long time we've used Telnet. Telnet's not really all that um, uh, secure. In fact, it's extremely unsecure. So today we've kind of, for the most part, we've replaced it. But we still use Telnet for certain things. Um, 
In the Unix world, X Windows displays will actually talk to one another over the internet. You can um, um, uh, move your desktops over the internet. Um, Windows doesn't talk X Windows, but it does talk something called virtual network computing. I think it also talks remote desktop or something. There are ways in the Windows world to move desktops across the internet too. Um, VNC, virtual network computer, is one system that will run on every operating system I can think of from Windows to um, obscure Unixes. Um, SSH is become a replacement for um, things like Telnet as a way. It, it's an encrypted protocol that allows us to communicate uh, between machines in a rather secure manner. Actually, a very secure manner. It, it's, it's cool. And there's hundreds of other protocols that go across the internet, <coughs> including <coughs> HTTP or the wide world web. OK, one of the things about the wide world web is it has hyperlinks. Uh, hyperlinks are cool. That means, it, you know, a hyperlink is when you go into um, a web page. Where's a web page? Um, pcc.edu. That's a web page. And you hit one of these links and it takes you to a different web page. Maybe a different web server. Maybe, maybe in a different country across the world. Uh, hyperlinks are kind of, you know, that's what the internet is kind of about. It's pretty cool. Um, I suppose we've talked about hyperlinks since the time of the Greek philosophers or before, but they really, you know, haven't been a big deal until recently. Um, the first time I ever saw a hyperlink in the internet was there was an old system used called Gopher, developed by the University of Minnesota. That it was the coolest thing in the world. It, 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 all you could do is alphanumeric articles, no graphics, nothing like that. But you could have these little links in your articles. You press on that link and it would take you to another server with another article. Uh, you might be in University of Minnesota with the first article and the next one be at Florida State and you're sitting in Oregon. It was cool. Okay, well, you know, it, it, actually it was very cool. Um, it, I mean, and it still is cool. Now, there were only, I don't know if there were ever more than a couple hundred Gopher servers that weren't, Gopher was not big like the wide world web, but Gopher was, you know, I, it was significant. And it really, a lot of us learned a lot from Gopher. At the same time, I will say there was a guy that was trying to do some of this with kind of hyperlinks or shared, where people could share a document and everybody could edit on the same document or, or something like that. Um, and he was working in Portland, Oregon, a man by the name of Ward Cunningham. And uh, always reminds me of happy days, but this is a different Ward Cunningham. He's about my age. He lives in Portland. And uh, he developed this kind of idea. And he went to Hawaii and he learned a little Hawaiian. And in Hawaiian, they, there was this word called wiki. So he called his concept wiki. Um, and it was kind of a management concept, but there was technology behind it. And, you know, he didn't know quite how to implement it, but he was working on this thing called Wiki. Um, and then the wide world web came along. Tim Berners-Lee out of um, CERN Institute in Switzerland um, 
although Tim Berners-Lee himself is a, uh, is a br uh, British citizen, uh, Tim Berners-Lee developed the wire, wor World Wide Web that had these hyperlinks. It had really cool stuff. And he developed something called HTML to make the whole thing work. And it was really cool. When Ward saw um, the word, when he was introduced to the word World Wide Web, Wide World Web, oh, well, whatever, um, he immediately said, this is the way of the future. And he wrote the first wiki. Um, website, um, which I think is at c3.org or something like that. Anyway, he wrote some software that made the first, uh, it would generate all the HTML and everything and you would have a, a wiki that you could enter text on. It was cool. And then, of course, people like Jamie Cameron came along and used Ward's ideas to start um, Wikipedia. A wiki this, wiki that, wiki, you know, we've got wiki websites every place. And we've got worldwide web websites every place. Even banks have we websites. I mean, okay, enough said. I mean, it's, and it's cool um, because it's based on these hyperlinks and, and various other things, but really the hyperlinks, that's really cool. Um, okay. It is a little kludgy, and we'll talk about how it's kludgy as we go on. But anyway, we can see things on the World Wide Web using a web browser like, um, well, this one is called um, uh, Chromium. And, you know, you can go on there, and this is kind of cool. There's pictures, there's. Uh, you press things and it brings up information about class schedules and I don't know you can do email over it in in you know on a website um, tells me about PCC um, I could go, yeah, it's cool. I can look up information using things like uh, Wikipedia. Um, oops, that just went to Google, which does a search of uh, the whole network and uh, internet and finds me Wikipedia. I want, oh my, there's English, there's German, there's a lot of languages, Malay. Well, Malay's in there someplace, but uh, um, and you know, and you got hyperlinks. Queen Isabella or Isabella of, I don't know who she is. Um, I think I heard about her the other day. Son of John. Okay, and um, and you can look things up that you never knew you wanted to know, like who Isabella is. Um, okay, that's cool. So we go back here, and we're going to um, that. Okay, and we're going to talk about web browsers. When you're when you are using the web, you use a web browser. But there's really a couple different parts to the web. There are web browsers. That's the thing you use when you look at the web. But then. There's got to be a computer someplace that spits data out and gives it to the web browser. Someplace way off in Never Never Land, there is a computer that will be spitting the data out. So the job of a web browser, and that's called a web server. Now the job of a web browser is to basically get this page of information render it so it looks pretty. Now, I just said that the world, uh, um, the wide world web is kind of kludgy. It should be that we get an HTML page, you render it, and it looks beautiful, and, you know, life is cool. And the, H, the HTML can do anything you want it to do that it seems like it's world wide, world wide, world webby in some sense. 
That doesn't work. We just didn't do it right. Tim Berners-Lee didn't do it right. Uh, uh, Tim Berners-Lee is a brilliant man. As I say, he's British. He has been knighted. He is Sir Tim Berners-Lee. Um, but he had something much more modest in mind. He didn't really envision us doing banking and uh, ordering things from Amazon or Harbor Freight or, or wherever. That wasn't really what he was thinking of. He was thinking of gopher and saying, can I do gopher better? So there's a lot of things you can't do using HTML. So people added something called JavaScript which was a programming, which was, which is a programming language that um, is built into most web servers. Most web servers can understand H, uh, JavaScript and it will modify and do cool things on your, uh, in making your website look cool that HTML can't do. And then somebody else came up with the idea, they said, ah, JavaScript's too complicated. We can do it using, well, we'll, we'll use a different syntax here. We'll, we'll call it cascading style sheets. So there is HTML, and there are cascading style sheets that can modify the HTML. And they're two different languages, but they kind of work together, and you kind of have to know both of them. Um, but it, I would call it a kludge, but, you know, it works. And then you can add JavaScript into this whole thing, and most browsers can understand HTML and cascading style sheets and JavaScript. And the truth is there is a yet another language called Java. Java, strange to say, is totally and completely unrelated to JavaScript. There's no relationship between the two. They're both programming languages. Um, they're different programming languages. Most or many of the uh, web browsers have Java virtual machines built into them and they can run Java code as well as JavaScript code, as well as CSS, as well as HTML. Okay. <coughs> and that's all done on your client computer in your web browser. What, you know, what's the name of a few web browsers? Well, Mosaic was the first web browser I ever used, first graphical web browser I ever used. Um, I don't know if it exists anymore. There was one called Netscape for a long, long time. Um, I think it's kind of become Chromium, only Chromium's a total rewrite of Netscape. It's much better than uh, Netscape ever was. Uh, Firefox, uh, by, uh, well, Chromium is by who? By Google. Uh, Firefox is by um, 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 uh, the Mozilla Foundation. Safari, Internet Explorer is an older one by Microsoft. They now use Edge. Um, Conqueror is another. Th there's a lot of them. I, and uh, actually, I'm forgetting some of the good ones. So there, there's a lot of them. But most of us probably use Chromium, Firefox, or Edge, um, I, I suspect. I don't know. Those, the job of those, once again, is to take all that information that is given to the web browser. It, it's first to go to a website and say, give me information. Then it takes all the information it gets from that website and it renders it in a pleasing manner. I wish they all rendered things the same. The truth is there's little tiny differences between the way they will render things and now and then it will get you goofed up. So you write JavaScript that works fine in uh, Chromium and it doesn't quite work in Edge. Uh, it, it, we're getting better and better, but we still have some problems. Okay. Um, so what's a web server? I talked about web servers. A web server is the other end of the thing. 
it is where people put their HTML and the job of the web server is to see, oh, um, okay I don't know what a web server is is it a computer or is it a computer application we use the term web server for both a web server really is just simply a piece of software that is always running every second a computer is up it's listening on a certain port on the internet for a request that says send me this HTML page and if it gets a request all it does is it takes your HTML page and maybe the associated uh, 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 CSS file a uh, little JavaScript a little Java uh, I don't know uh, all of that gunk and just ships it down to the web browser it's a very easy job it doesn't have to do any thinking. It just sends it all down to the browser. The browser does all the hard work of rendering that and making sense of it. Okay. Sometimes we use the term web server for the computer that is running the red web server program. Other times we use the term web server just for the program that is being ran. Most web servers, really 95% of what they do is just to run the web server program um, and a few associated programs. Um, it, and that's about it. Um, it's a very easy job, I, I think. Uh, there's a lot of web servers in the world, but I think about 70% of the world's websites are ran by an open source web server called Apache. Apache is a really cool, really good web server that will do almost anything for you and is pretty secure. Um, well, not perfect, but it, it, uh, Apache is an incredible web server. There are other web servers but uh, Apache is really the main one that most commercial people use and a lot of the other web servers are sometimes I, I sometimes use web servers that are not Apache but then I, I, I run the web server on my local computer it prepares stuff and then it ships it off where Apache sends it to the public. So Apache is being used as something we call a proxy server. So, oh, I guess some people use Squid. Well, Squid's another proxy server, but 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 we do use uh, Apache serves a lot of the world. Um, Apache is really important as a web server. Okay, I said this was a simple job being a web server. Nothing complicated about it. Well, I lied. It can be a simple job if you have static web pages that it's just plain HTML. There's not a lot to do. Um, but even then it gets a little bit complicated because a web server may actually be serving 15, 20 different, 100 different sites. The same web server may be serving davidmandel.com and janeaustin.com and um, um, uh, pdxlinux.org. That can all be served by the same web server and, and Apache's got to keep all that separate and know whether the request was for davidmandel.com or janeaustin.com and get all that separate. The other thing though is most web pages actually are not plain simple HTML. I guess we're learning to write plain simple HTML because that is step one. Uh, learn to write HTML and learn to write CSS. However, most web sites are actually kind of built by a program and there'll be a program in the background that is running a, pro a software that is maybe accessing a database and this software is written in oh, Perl or Python or PHP. Uh, often PHP because um, PHP is also written by the Mozilla Foundation. The people, oh no, I'm sorry, by the Apache Foundation, the people that do the Apache web server. But you can use most any language. 
And a lot of people do use um, Perl, Python, Ruby, TCL, what, um, yeah. Lisp. I, I don't know. A any language will work. C, Fortran, I, 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 most any language. But, um, and what that, those languages will do, uh, those programs, in the background on the web server <coughs> is suppose you get a request for a web page and the request comes in and says something about my name is David Mandel and I want to know um, how much money is in my bank account right now. Okay. Well, there's no page there saying you've got $5 in your bank account. Five dollars and five cents. Okay. Instead, there is a program that goes off, goes into the bank's database, say it gets out the number five dollars and five cents on a good day. So then it shoots off to the weather forecast at the national weather site and says, "Is this a good day or a bad day?" The forecast says this is a good day. So you do really have five dollars and five cents if. Um, if the moon is in the proper phase, so it's got to go out to the NASA database to find out what phase the moon is in. And it all comes back and it says that after all these calculations, I've got $3.25 in my bank account. It, the program then mashes together lots of HTML that probably some HTML coder wrote. And it puts in $3.24 in the right slot in this HTML. It puts it down onto the um, um, system that gets sent out as a web page. So the web pages are very, very dynamic. They're not the simple type ones that we're writing every day, but they're calculated on the fly. However, in order to make these web pages calculate on, on the fly, somebody needs to know how to write HTML and how to write CSS and how to write the Python code or PHP code that did all this other stuff. So, so a web server can be actually be very, very complex, as complex as a web browser. But they're two different pieces of software. They're both very complex. There's the web server. There's the web browser. Now things still get a little more complicated because these are writing on the internet. How in the world does the web browser know where to make the request to? There's a lot of internet servers on, or a lot of uh, web servers on the internet. There's web servers in, um, you know, 185 different countries. There's Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if there's 12 web servers in my office and maybe more. Uh, there's a lot of web servers in the world. Okay, so how in the world do I find out which ones? Well, that's got something to do with the internet and the way the internet works. And something called domain name registration and domain name service DNS and well, the first thing is suppose I want to have a name um, davidmandel.com. I would have to register davidmandel.com at some official site to make me an official part of the internet. The way, and the way I would do that is I would go, um, there's a, um, um, a consortium called the International Consortium of Assigned Names and Numbers, ICANN. And they have this huge bureaucracy that says who can make up domain name, new domain names and register them and how they get registered and um, things of that type. And down at some level, some company like uh, in in the United States or for for dot coms dot orgs dot nets and a few other dots, a company like a, a domain name registration company like say GoDaddy or Network Solutions or Easy Space or 
can do that for you. They are officially registered to be a domain name register. And so I sign up with them and I get my domain name. This is not a web server. This is not anything else, but I get my uh, my domain name for, you know, I don't know, $10 a year, $20 a year. It, it depends on where I go because, you know, they all vary in price. It also depends. I think a .org is a little less or a little more than a .com. Um, so I, I, but usually it's ten, twenty, thirty dollars. Uh, thirty dollars a year is outrageous, but ten, twenty, thirty dollars a year. Um, if I get, yeah, and that's kind of the way it works. <coughs> um, suppose I want a, a, a DavidMandel.com. That would be a great domain name for David Mandel. <laughs> So yeah, maybe I want that. Uh, how do I know if I can get it? Well, if I go to something like GoDaddy, this is not an endorsement for GoDaddy, but I use them for half my sites or more. Uh, I, I I use various domain name registrars, but yeah, GoDaddy is fine. And I type in David Mandel. Okay. Let's search. Uh, well, maybe .com. Um, I, okay. Here is an example of what I said. I typed in David Mandel. It's got to give me back a lot of HTML and JavaScript and CSS that will render on this graphics. But you know, it's giving me things about David Mandel. So, in other words, in the background at GoDaddy on their web servers or their infrastructure behind their web servers, they have all sorts of programs running that look in databases that can tell you uh, whether Go uh, DavidMandel.com is taken and maybe get some new names and find out whether they're taken. And then it forms a new web page and sends it to me. If I was looking for nancymandel.com, it would give me a different web page. So, you know, the, the, the HTML type information being shot back is calculated on the fly. Okay. Uh, it says here that davidmandel.com is taken. Um, but but I could get davidmandel.us. I could get uh, all of these others. I could get. Uh, can I get davidmandel.de? Well, davidmandel.de is a German name, or Ger that's a d dot de's are German, or dot my's are are uh, Malaysian, or dot sg's are Singaporean. Dot VAs are Vatican City, I, I think. I, I'm not sure. Um, and it turns out that I would have to go to those countries and I'd have to figure out what system they use for assigning domain names. I can't, uh, GoDaddy won't handle them. Uh, actually, I, I think to get a dot DE or a dot FR for France, I think I have to be living in uh, Europe in a common um, part of the European Union, as I recall. The last time I got names there, I had <coughs> a colleague, uh, a business partner that was living in Latvia. Um, uh, for dot UK, English names anybody can get. Um, so it, it depends on the country. Okay. Um, and then davidmandel.com, some some guy took it. How do I know who took it? Well, in Unix, in Unix there is a command, or Linux, or I guess that would be Macintosh as well, uh, OS X uh, 10 or 11 or whatever. Um, there will be a command who is, if it's not on your system, you can get it. It's open source. Download it and, you know, 
And so there will be a command who is. So let's uh, actually somebody already typed in who is. Uh, but they typed in this one. Let's type in who is davidmandel.com. And it gives me a lot of information. And that includes, it says davidmandel.com. The domain name registrar is GoDaddy. Um, it was created in 1999 it is uh, it expires in 2021 unless he pays more money or she um, there's a couple registrar information things like if you do something abusive or there's um, there's I can um, here's the DNS is used That doesn't tell me who owns it. I would have to use some flags on the command to find out who owns it. But uh, let's go with this one. I think this one may tell me who owns it. Let's, uh, what was I looking at? pdxlinux.org. OK, sometimes the who is will tell me who owns them and all sorts of things. It really should tell me that, but like GoDaddy has been getting chintzier on the information they get back. There are flags that I can set on my command and then it will give me full information, but I don't want to spend the time to look up what flags I have to use. But here we see for a pdxlinux.org, we see the same sort of information. Uh, if I wait until 2018 and this guy is sleep, the owner is sleeping, I may be able to steal that from him. That would be a nasty thing to do. And the owner of this domain will not be sleeping. Um, um, okay, it says here the registry registrant or the registrant name is David Mandel with the Portland Linux Unix group. <laughs> and this is the a address of record. Surprisingly, that's where I live. Um, and that's his email address and various things. So if I wanted to buy that domain, I'd contact that person. Now, some domains are held in proxy where they hide all that information. I do not approve of using proxies to hide that information. I think that's a little bit, it's not grossly unethical, but I, 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 I think you, if you own a domain, you should take responsibility for the domain unless you're maybe a political dissident or somebody who has a good reason to want to hide your uh, identity. I, I have nothing against People, you know, if I'm running a site saying downwithchina.com and I'm Chinese, maybe I have a good reason not to, uh, or downwithchinesegovernment.com, uh, maybe I have a good reason to want to hide my name and not, um, and use a proxy because, you know, I don't want to be arrested. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. So, but for most of us, it's shoddy not to take responsibility for what we do. So, uh, you know. Uh, I got another one up here called Caligator.com or Caligator.org. If you're not familiar with this website, <coughs> look up. Uh, use your web browser to go to Caligator.org. It's a uh, calendar of events, mostly open source events in the Portland area. It's kind of a wiki calendar. It's cool and almost all these events are free, the majority of them. And um, Portland is a center of open source software and um, we have a wonderful calendar of events. Any night of the week you can, you've got the choice of 
half a dozen or more events to go to. You could never go to all of them. It, it's cool. Um, okay, going back to our talk here. Oops. Oh, and if you don't have the who is command, I think it exists for Windows too. <coughs> I think I've had it on my Windows computers. But if you don't have the who is command, um, there are who is is built into uh, on the web. Maybe GoDaddy has a who is uh, uh, as part of their website, or a lot of domain name people do have who is commands as part of their website. I prefer to use a who is command that looks directly at the who is database because I'm always. I have heard, there are unethical people in the world. I have heard from reliable sources of domain name registrars that provide who is access. This happened years ago. There was a company or more than one who sometimes when you were looking up the uh, uh, to see if a domain name was available, they would capture your information and they would then go out and buy the domain before you could buy it so they could resell it to you. Uh, how much does a domain name cost in general if you want to buy an existing one? Uh, it varies. I've heard a beer.com once sold for a million dollars. It's <laughs> not worth a million dollars. Uh, not in today's market. I the most expensive domain I've ever bought was sixty two hundred dollars for open dot. Uh, let me mm, was sixty two hundred dollars. I I won't say what I spent. Uh, 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 what I bought exactly for that. Uh, I've seen them sell for mm, uh, millions of dollars of worthless paper. <laughs> Um, uh, one in particular I remember very well for a quarter million dollars. I've also seen them sell for 50 or 100 dollars or given away. Um, so, and that's probably more common. Most of them are probably a couple hundred dollars. I've always got offers to buy davidmandel.com, which I do own. I don't have a website on it, but I own it and I use the email address. and. I've never been willing to sell it. It's other David Mandels would like to buy it from me, and I've never been willing to sell it because um, I've never negotiated. But I would require a lot of money because I'd have to redo so many things. It really would cost me a lot of money to change domain names, and I've got other domain names I could go to, but it'd be a lot of work, and you know I don't want to do it. So. <coughs> developing uh, websites. Well, one way to develop websites is to do it locally on your computer. If all you're doing is static HTML and cascading style sheets, you can just do it on your computer and point the web browser to those files and they will render perfectly. And there's no problem and it's simple and it's easy. And you can develop your web pages using a text processor like uh, Emacs or Notepad or whatever and um, test them on your computer. Uh, someday if you like them and you get access to a web server, you put them over there and they will the whole world can see them. Um, or if you want a fancier environment to work with, you can work with uh, uh, Apple has a program called Dreamweaver, which is kind of a what you see is what you get uh, uh, type system for developing web pages uh, or websites. Actually, you could use LibreOffice, but I don't recommend that. That's not what it's made for. Um, uh, Microsoft has one called Front Page. I do not recommend Front Page. At least when I used to use Front Page, it, it's it doesn't play well with other companies' products. Um, uh, Dreamweaver does. It's 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 a good product. Um, 
Microsoft makes a lot of good products. Uh, they make a few bad products. I, I consider front page to be one of those. Um, unless it's improved a great deal since I've used it. Um, or you can develop your web pages on the web server itself. That's usually what I do. Um, but then I've usually got my own web servers. So, uh, and if I don't, well, I put a web server on one of my computers. Um, the web server, um, um, and if you've got a dynamic site that has programming and has databases in the back end and all that sort of stuff, you really have to do it on a running web server because there's no way you could develop that on your own computer because you've got to access all this other stuff as you go. So um, in that case, you would do the development on a web server. And that can vary, the difficulty of that can vary a great deal. If you've got full access to everything like I generally have, you know, the web server may be on the computer sitting in front of me. <laughs> and uh, it's not bad. If you've got to go through a lot of bureaucracy to deal with the web, service pe uh, web server people, it can be a real pain. Um, in my case, it's generally been pretty easy. There's also another system of developing things on a web server that I would call content management systems. Content management systems are ready-made software that you can then modify and configure that will do incredible things just out of the package. Usually, they're not totally appropriate, so you may have to modify them a little bit. And the names of a few of these are, I always say Wikimedia, I, but that's the name of the corporation, nonprofit corporation. But MediaWiki is the software that, um, that um, um, Wikipedia uses. The, the Wikipedia uses software called uh, MediaWiki. That is open source software. I've set up quite a few wiki sites. Well, a few wiki sites using a MediaWiki. I've also used TikiWiki and several other wikis. There's a lot of wiki software. Another content management package that's quite popular for building websites is called Drupal. Uh, there's a lot of Oregonians use Drupal for one reason or another. Another one is called Joomla, spelled with an exclamation mark. Uh, Joomla is, uh, it originally had the name Momble, but the Momble people got into a big fight. So the Momble people went that direction, and what was left of the core developers, Joomla, went the other direction. And, you know, the Joomla people I know come out of uh, Canada, like uh, Montreal or something. They're French-Canadian uh, for the most part. Um, but they've got a lot, a worldwide group of people developing Joomla. I think the Mongol people are, are Australians, but I don't know. Uh, another uh, uh, package of that type is WordPress. Now, WordPress, WordPress.com is a is a word uh, is a website that will let that will give you where a uh, WordPress um, websites that you can you can do your own thing with. You can write your own webs. Or, uh, you can write your own WordPress wor websites at wor WordPress.com. But if you want to build your own server, you can also do that using the WordPress software because it's open source. Written in PHP, I think. I don't remember. OpenACS. Open ECS isn't used that much. I mean, it's used enough that it, it exists, and it's. Uh, but I put it on the list here. It's written in TC, a programming language called TCL. It's not utterly popular, but it's popular enough that it's 20 years old. Um, it's written by, uh, or it's founded. The head people behind that are uh, are 
come from Portland, so I put it on because it's a it's an Oregonian Oregon product. Uh, Pone's Ope. I put this on because it's one of my favorites. Um, it's written in Python, and um, it's cool. You can do anything with it, but it's hard to use. Um, it's written mostly by a German group combined with a group in the east coast of the US, like the Sloan School of Business at, I don't know where that is, but uh, um, it's a really cool thing. It is complicated. It even comes, it comes with its own database management system. It comes with its own web server. And, and then you usually, you use their database in combination with other databases like Postgres or MySQL or yet better known ones. And you use their web server, which is cool, but it's not that secure. So you use Apache as a proxy service for their web server. And, and everything works out great. It, it really is a good system, but it is complex. I, uh, there's uh, one called Moodle. Uh, Moodle is a lot like Blackboard, only it's open source. And a lot of schools use Moodle. Oregon State University uses some Moodle. A lot of schools use Moodle. Black, uh, Blackboard is a commercial product. It's the first commercial product I put down here. It's proprietary. And, um, you know, it, it's a learning system uh, for schools, but it's also a content management system. And of course, there's our friend Desire to Learn, which is also highly proprietary and, you know. And there's about a million more. Um, and, um, and there's even a list of them on Wikipedia at this site. There's a list of them. This is the most complete list I know of, but there's thousands that are not on this list. Uh, but you'll see there's Java-based ones, uh, Java packages, well, Java-based ones, uh, Microsoft uh, .NET ones, Perl-based ones. There's TWiki, uh, PHP-based ones. Most all of these are open source. Um, uh, Django is a pretty popular one. Uh, Python-based ones. Ruby on Rails ones, Cold Fusion ones, JavaScript ones, and OpenACS, which is other, TCL. Uh, and then there's proprietary systems, and there's hundreds of those. So, you know, uh, take what you want. Um, uh, okay, I'm going to start to close up here, but I'm going to close up a little bit here with just one final discussion on web browsers. A little more on web browsers. What I talked about for web browsers were the what I call graphical web browsers. They're ones like we use every day. They're like our good friend here, uh, Mozilla or Firefox. And you know, you can do pretty cool things here. You can do YouTube. And you know, it looks pretty cool. Uh, what is that? Shotgun shell. Wow. Oh god, I wouldn't want to do that. Uh, um, how to Huge culture, uh, the amazing grow method. That's that 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 would be worth watching. That's a cool way to grow uh, raised beds. Uh, in in a way, uh, you know, you can get web browsers that will even show movies, uh, uh, which is cool. And these are all very graphical in nature, right? I'm not self-sufficient. Me. Graphical. Okay. The other type of web browser that exists, though, is there are a number of command line web browsers. Only a Unix person would like these. 
I don't, I don't know what they're, well, yeah, I, are they good for anything? They're weird, but there are a number of web browsers. Now, some of them, they don't, they don't do graphics. Um, they don't, uh, some of them don't interpret JavaScript. They don't interpret, um, 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 uh, well, Java. Uh, they may not, they, CSS is worthless to them because they're not rendering things that well. But they're command line browsers. Let's take a little look at one of them. Just Come on. Well, maybe it's not there. Well, here. We'll go here. Links is one of these. Curl is another one. WGET is one. There's probably a lot of others. I've used all three of these. Uh, let's look at a website. Uh, www. At google.com is nice because it's a very simple website. Let's look at that website and see what we get. Oh, it, it, it asked me whether I want to allow a cookie. What a cookie is, is a cookie is something that the system puts onto your computer so it can then ask whether, ask you things about your computer. So, so you know, suppose I log on to a website as David Mandel. It may want to put a cookie on my thing saying I'm David Mandel so that when it gets a new page from me, it can say, oh, that's David Mandel, so I will get his bank account. So it helps them keep track of sessions for individual users. Uh, and it can do bad things, too. But it does a lot of good things, so we allow them. I'm going to say always. Usually I just say yes, but I know there's going to be a lot of requests, so I'm going to say A for always. Okay, and here is a, uh, the, does that look anything like Google looks? I don't know. Now, unfortunately, Google doesn't always look the same to everybody. This is what's, you know, becoming weird about the web is Google, this is Google here uh, on mine. It gives me this thing and it gives me uh, question in French. Uh, French, terrific. Uh, my French is not very good. Oops, I just had a light fall down and I'm not going to bother picking it up. Anyway, um, but um, Google, um, uh, one of the things that a lot of web sites do is they ask you what web browser you're using and they'll give you a different, slightly different page depending on what web browser you're using. So what I look up in Chromium, when I look up Google in Chromium, it may be a little bit different than when I look it up in, um, in um, uh, links. Um, there. Yeah, well, I had to go around in circles because of the fact that I'm using Chromium. It would have been easier if I'd shown this using Firefox, but that's okay. Uh, okay, and you see here, well, anyway, I get something where I can do a search. Let me go down here and I'm going to do a search in this browser. Okay, search for gardens of Normandy. Now this is pretty weird and you're, I'm sure you're going to ask why would anyone ever want to do this. Okay, it brings up the search of the gardens of Normandy, I, I believe. Let me go down here and just see what I've got here. 
It didn't give me the gardens, did it? It's giving me something else. It's giving me stuff, information about Google. Uh, let's get out. Let's try it again. Sorry. Always? Gardens of Normandy. Ah, there we go. And it says Parks and Gardens of Normandy. Let me go over here and look at this. And you're going to ask, why in the heck would I ever use uh, one of these browser, uh, one of these uh, um, non-graphical browsers? And I'm about to answer that. As soon as we get an idea that we're getting kind of the same sort of information, there are the parks and gardens of Normandy tourism France. If I go back to the other, uh, the, the Lynx web browser instead of the Chromium one, I get Parks and Gardens of Normandy, France. And if I look down here, I will see that I have pretty much the same information that I get with the, uh, with the um, uh, graphical browser. I never want to use this browser. I've used it at times uh, when I've had very, very slow internet. It, it's, uh, you know, and I want to just forget all the graphics and just try to get anything through. Like if I'm talking to something on the moon, I've never talked to anything on the moon, but, but you know, uh, sometimes your bandwidth is pretty pathetic. Uh, I have talked to things under the ocean and that's a case where your bandwidth can be pretty bad, although it's improved over the years. Um, in any case, um, you might want to use it in a low bandwidth situation, but where you really want to use these graphical web or non-graphical web browsers is when you're writing scripts that you want to automate tasks over the internet. <coughs> Suppose I'm trying to find every site on the internet that talks about uh, the gardens of southwestern Iran. And, uh, well, I Google for that. But suppose I don't have Google or uh, for some reason. I would then try to s write a script that would automatically go through, get every website I could ever dream of getting, and search for gardens of southwestern Iran. And if it finds a yes, it keeps the name of that website, and it gives it it sends that sends me an email saying, "Look at that website, and look at this website, or something of that type." And it does all that in the background because it's going to take days, maybe months for that to run. And so I don't want to sit there doing that with a graphical web browser, but I can do that with my own. Um, uh, but I can write a program that automates all that. And to do that, either I've got to write my own web browser using sockets and using a lot of network type stuff in, say, C or else I can do it using scripting languages um, by using some of these uh, non-graphical web browsers. And these are very, very handy for us programmers. We use a lot. I use them. I use them quite a lot. I can even make them where they can log. They can send a username and a password and log on to a site and look at a site. So, oh, as an example, I can do something like I have a I'm a member of a timeshare system. I haven't, but I could write a program that uh, every 
so often, like every five minutes, goes logs onto the timeshare system and says, is this apartment available? If so, uh, book it. Uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And thus I could get apartments that other people can't get because they're never available. But if they're available, I will get it. Or, you know, the same way that eBay, when you're on eBay, what you can set a price and a time so that it will escalate your price to a certain point. Well, you can write that sort of thing yourself by using these uh, graphical or non-graphical web browsers. One final thing I'm going to mention is who all owns web servers? Web servers, you know, big companies have these in the back rooms of big places. And uh, there's billions of web servers in a web farm in Redmond, Oregon, or Google has a farm in uh, out of the Dalles. Uh, but there are amazing things like Where in the hell did it go? Sorry, sorry, didn't mean that. Ah, this little box. This is a network extender. Uh, it, it extends it extends my wireless network. It's a uh, Netgear wireless extender, or maybe it could be a wireless access point. Or guess what? That is probably a Linux box. I don't really know. Running an ARM chip uh, because it's cheap. Um, and how do I access that? Uh, it says right here that I access that by going to http colon slash slash 10.10.0.1 or something like that. Guess what? That's because it's got a web server built in. A lot of our tools and instruments, these little dumb things like this, have web servers built in. That's why I can say, oh, I've got 10 or 15 web servers in my office. Um, and I'm not even counting my big, the web servers that I've developed as, as part of, you know, part of what I do. Um, we've got web servers every place. Um, your phone may have one. My phone does not have a web server on it, but it could. It's, uh, it's no reason I couldn't put a web server on it. I just don't know why I'd want to at the moment. Uh, I could think of a reason. Uh, maybe it will have a web server tomorrow. <laughs> anyway, these things are very common. Um, web servers and, um, and, uh, and, uh, and web browsers and um, so I have spent quite a bit of time making this video. <laughs> and if you've listened to it, you've spent a lot of time listening to me talk. But uh, that, you know, gives you an idea what all of this is about. And what you're, if you're doing assignments three and four, you're just, you're basically doing everything on your own local computer, learning how to write what I'd call simple static websites. And that's a valuable tool that fits into this whole entire framework. Uh, and as you go on in your studies and your career, you will learn more about this. Uh, you, it takes a long time to learn a lot about this. But that's where we're at and where we're going. And uh, with that. Uh, you know, thank you very much. Bye-bye.